When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but lots and pour contempt on all my pride forbid it Lord that I should boast save in the death of That charm me most I sacrifice them to his blood See from his head Everybody, welcome to Wednesday of this third week of Ordinary Time, and um, we begin to talk about the church today, but today is also the feast of St. Francis de Sales. This is post-Reformation time, um, and he was the Bishop of Geneva, which was the hotbed of the Reformation, and his life was in danger quite often, and the different things that he did. He, along with Jean de Chantel, uh, founded this uh, religious community called the Sisters of the Visitation, 
that uh, were one of the few orders of those days outside the cloister walls and actually doing the work of evangelization in those days. And uh, during all this time, he's a great, apparently a great spiritual director. And he <clears throat> wrote a book, excuse me, titled The Introduction to the Devout Life, which I have read over and over again. Some parts of it quite relevant at the time I was reading it for my own life. So we pray through the intercession of Francis de Sales, a great bishop, a very pastoral man. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Again, today we talk about the church. Let's pray through the intercession of St. Francis de Sales and ask God for his mercy. Lord Jesus, you call the church to be true. Lord, have mercy. You, you, you call the church to be an, evangel uh, an instrument of evangelization. Christ, have mercy. You call your church to form disciples. Lord, have mercy. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who for the salvation of souls willed that the bishop, Francis de Sales, become all things to all, graciously grant that following his example, we may always display the gentleness of your charity in the service of our brothers and sisters. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the second book of Samuel. That night the Lord spoke to Nathan and said, Go tell my servant David. Thus says the Lord, Should you build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day on which I led the children of Israel out of Egypt to the present, but I have been going about in a tent under cloth. In my wanderings, everywhere among the children of Israel, did I ever utter a word to any of the judges whom I charged to tend my people Israel to ask, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, speak thus to my servant David. The Lord of hosts has this to say, It was I who took you from the pasture and from the care of the flock to be commander of my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you went, and I have destroyed all your enemies before me. And I will make you famous like the great ones of the earth. I will fix a place for my people Israel. I will plant them so they may dwell in their place without further disturbance. Neither shall the wicked continue to afflict them as they did of old, since the time I first appointed judges over my people Israel. I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also reveals to you that he will establish a house for you. And when the time comes and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise you up, your heir after you, sprung from your loins, and I will make his kingdom firm. It is he who shall build a house for my name, and I will make his royal throne firm forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. And if he does wrong, I will correct him with the rod of men and with human chastisements. But I will not withdraw my favor from him, as I withdrew it from your predecessor Saul, whom I removed from my presence." Your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me. Your throne shall stand firm forever. Nathan reported all these words and this entire vision to David. The word of the Lord. The son of David will live forever. a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will make your dynasty stand forever and establish your throne through all ages. The son of David will live forever. The son of David will live forever. He shall cry out to me, you are my father. My God, the rock that brings me victory. I myself make him firstborn, most high over the kings of the earth. The son of David will live forever. The son of David will live forever. Forever I will maintain my love for him. 
my covenant with him stands firm. I will establish his dynasty forever, his throne as the days of the heavens. Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. On another occasion, Jesus began to teach by the sea. A very large crowd gathered around him so that he got into a boat by the sea and sat down. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on land. And he taught them at length in parables. In the course of his instruction, he said to them, Hear this. A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path. And the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it had little soil. It sprang up at once because the soil was not deep. And when the sun rose, it was scorched and withered for lack of roots. Some seed fell among thorns. The thorns grew up and choked it, and it produced no grain. And some seed fell on rich soil and produced fruit. It came up and grew and yielded 30, 60, and 100 fold. He added, whoever has ears to hear ought to hear. And when he was alone, those present along with the twelve questioned him about the parables. He answered them, The mystery of the kingdom of God has been granted to you. But to those, to those outside, everything comes in parables so that they may look and see but not perceive, and hear and listen but not understand, in order that they may not be converted and be forgiven. Jesus said to them, Do you not understand this parable? Then how you can understand any of the parables? The sower sows the word. Those are the one, these are the ones on the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes at once and takes away the word sown in them. And, there, and these are the ones sown in rocky ground, who when they hear the word, receive it at once with joy, but they have no roots, and they last only for a time. Then when tribulation or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. And those sown among thorns are another sort. They are a people who hear the word, but worldly anxiety and lure of riches and the cravings of other things intrude and choke the word, and it bears no fruit. No fruit. But those sown on rich soil are the ones that hear the word of God, accept it, and bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I wanted to share a little, a little story. I, this was not my experience. And someone uh, that was in the Holy Land recently said to me that uh, uh, the person that was leading the, the pilgrimage there actually did get into a boat like Jesus in the Gospel today. And they all kind of stood around the, the shore and he began to speak. And he, they, they all said how remarkable it was, how clear uh, they heard this leader uh, speaking to them, kind of like Jesus in the gospel today. He gets in a boat, goes out a little bit, and the people are standing around the shore, and they could hear everything that he was saying. And so here we are today, and we uh, begin this time of hearing parables that Jesus is speaking to all of us. And um, it must be really, really important because he starts in Mark's gospel to talk about the kingdom. What is the kingdom of God like for us? And so we get this first parable today. The sower is God the Father. The seed is Jesus. 
the soil, of course, is all of us. Now, Robert Capon, in his book called Parables of the Kingdom, offers some interesting insights about this particular parable. It attempts to answer the question, what is the kingdom of God like? In our little word thing up here, God's kingdom is, look at all those different things up there. And Capon mentions four different things that the kingdom of heaven, uh, kingdom of God, is like here on earth. Number one, he says the kingdom is Catholic, which means universal. How sad it is. Back in the very beginning, when the early church were called Christians because they were followers of Christ, but almost simultaneously they were called Catholic, which meant that this uh, gospel, this new faith, was moving everywhere. How sad it is that somewhere along the way the word Catholic got uh, somehow uh, stuck into a kind of a little box where it just talks about one particular aspect of uh, Christians, uh, the, the Roman Catholics, which I, you know, I, I, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm attached to Rome, of course, but I am a Catholic, but I'm a Christian. They're simultaneous to me. And the word Catholic does mean universal. It means that this, this word of God, this kingdom spreads everywhere. That's what it should mean. And we should be the people that spread it everywhere. But the whole idea of the word Catholic uh, uh, um, getting lost into just simply one particular aspect of the Christian tradition is, is kind of a sad thing. It still should continue to mean universal. One holy Catholic uh, apostolic church spreads everybody, spreads everywhere into everybody. Number two, he says, the kingdom is mysterious. We want God. We, the kingdom is something that isn't what we exactly always want it to be. Again, like the early church or like, you know, yeah, the early church, I guess we should say, they really want it to be a political thing. Well, I don't want to say the early church. Maybe let's say the time before Jesus' resurrection, the time of uh, Jesus' active ministry in the world, um, his three years of his active ministry. They kept on waiting for a political or a military leader, and he offered none of that. And so Jesus never seems to offer the kingdom as we expect it, even today. Because even today, in many ways, we still want it to be some political. He's still looking for this great political leader that's going to save us instead of being living the gospel. So we're like, so we're like Jesus be the one who really, really saves us. And so we want fireworks, but the kingdom seems to be something that goes underground and sometimes disappears and then sprouts up in all kinds of different places. Number three, the kingdom is actuality. The sower doesn't think about it. He doesn't imagine it. He does it. He goes out and he sows the seed. Jesus sows the seed. The church is supposed to be sowing the seed. Not talking about it, not throwing plans about it, but getting out there and actually doing it. And number four, the kingdom is hostility and response. I think this one's easy for us. We see the hostility about God's kingdom and, and what he wants to offer to our world. And, and that's the saddest thing. However, please let us not confuse people's hostility toward the kingdom to our scandalous way we live the gospel and then people reject it because of that. That's two different things. But there is a certain hostility about the kingdom and the birds, the sun, the thorns, all these things are expressions of that hostility toward the kingdom. But the harvest will come 30, 60, 100 fold. And by the way, that would all three of those would be bumper crops. 100 fold beyond the wildest imagination of a farmer back in those days. And yet the kingdom still continues to grow to our day here today. So Catholic, mysterious, actual, the kingdom is here. And there's a certain hostility and or response to the kingdom. There are four different aspects of this kingdom that we are all a part of here today. So here's my questions for today. Is that the kingdom you know that I just share with all of you? And here are the most important question for all of us. What kind of soil have we been? So thanks for watching and I'm looking forward to seeing you again very soon. I will do it tomorrow is the um, conversion of Paul, one of the great feasts of the church here, I think. I love that one. But uh, 
let's prepare for that uh, and look at our own conversion as well. So good to see you and looking to see you again very, very soon. Goodbye now.